thank you to everybody for joining us this morning. We're going to be talking about uh, reduced pressure zone backflow preventers, but not so much about how they work or whose is where or what like that. We're more going to talk about what SANS 10252 says about them. Before we start the presentation, uh, we just want to go through a couple of points again, just as a reminder how each one of us can prevent COVID-19 and do our little bit. Make sure that you wear a mask when you're out in public or even when you're in close proximity with your fellow co-workers. Wash your hands with soap or preferably an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth when your hands are unwashed. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Obviously, we don't know if they're sick, whether it is from COVID or something else. So let's take that precaution and try and stay away from them. When you cough or sneeze, uh, sneeze into a flexed elbow, winter tissue, and then throw the tissue in the bin or preferably flush it down the toilet or something like that so that it's totally out of the way. Clean and disinfect disinfect your frequently used surfaces and objects. This would include your tools that you work with or share with your co-workers. That is all then on the COVID part of it. So then let's get into backflow and what it is and what SAN says about it. So backflow is the protection against pollution. So we don't want our potable water coming from the municipality to be contaminated with water downstream that cannot be vouched for. So this would be either from an individual house or to a whole complex. So you could actually do the backflow prevention at the beginning of say a townhouse complex or a block of flats. There you don't put one in each installation downstream, but at a domestic installation, obviously you would do it for that single house, not for a whole block of uh, houses. The definition then of pollution, uh, it is defined as any relative degradation of the quality of potable water. Potable or polluted water is that of a lesser quality than specified by SANS 241. So where would we get this polluted water from? Well, it may not be polluted as we see it, but as it says there, it hasn't been tested and verified by SANS 241. So this would be water from your boreholes, rainwater harvesting, uh, recycled grey water, or anywhere where you're working at a factory where there's chemical processes or toxic substances, medical installations. I'm sure we all understand medical installations, especially these days, with the diseases like COVID that's going around. And then obviously from veterinary uh, procedures or anything where there is a chance of getting some sort of uh, toxicity into our water before or after the municipal supply. Now, how would backflow occur? Obviously the municipality is pushing water towards us and what makes it flow in the wrong direction? Well, we all know that water flows to an area of lesser pressure. So it tries to equalize the pressure in a system. So if the municipality have cut the water supply due to uh, maintenance or anything like that, it could be a burst pipe. Obviously, that's going to now be a reduced pressure scenario. And our water from our installation can flow back to that. Or if for some reason we increase the water pressure at our installation due to a pressure pump or whatever, then ours is now again higher pressure than downstream or yeah, upstream from where it's coming. So therefore it can flow back there again too. Now, for the purposes of risk assessment, they have broken up the water categories into five different categories. Category one is your, uh, water that's used for human consumption coming directly from a potable water distribution system. So that's your normal water that comes from the municipality. Category two is fluid presenting no human health hazard, 
but the quality of which can have undergone a change in taste, odor, or color, or temperature. So that would be then where you have water softeners on your line, uh, anything like that. And then temperature. Most of our houses, we have actually got a water heater, a geyser as we commonly know it. So we've heated the, the water, it's changed temperature. So most of our houses would fall into a category two. Category three then is fluid presenting some human health hazard due to the presence of one or more harmful substances. Category four is fluid presenting a human health hazard due to the presence of one or more toxic or very toxic substances like radioactive, mutagenic, or carcinogenic substances. So this would be most of your uh, medical installations, things like that. In category five is the worst one, where it is fluid presenting human health due to microbiological or viral elements. So then now we've broken the water into different categories and then the backflow prevention devices have then again also been broken up into groups and types. There are eight families identified by the letters A, B, C, D, E, G, H, and L. And you'll see that certain of the letters have been skipped like F. I think it's because it looks very much like an E, so you could confuse it. So they've stayed away from those. And then each of these eight families have then been broken up into another four groups of A, B, C, or D. Now, normally your B, A type is of backflow preventers, what is used for categories one to four. So most of the ones that you would ever work with is a normal B, A type uh, backflow preventer. Then for the worst one, we use an A, A type which is unrestricted air gap. So that would be where there's absolutely no way of water flowing back because there's no physical connection between our installation and the municipal supply. So you would have that, for instance, with a water that goes into a reservoir or a Jojo type tank where there's no silence a pipe or anything like that so where the water comes out it is higher than the water level and if we go into sands there are specific gaps depending on the size of your float valve that you've got to keep there then we get to the sands part we've now just discussed on how all the categorization and so forth takes place but in sands 10252.1 and then sub section 7.1 it talks about the preservation of water and water quality and there if we have a look at 7411 it says adequate measures shall be taken to prevent deterioration of the quality of water so it's not like you should try or anything like that it's a definite you shall then if we have a look at 742 it talks about the connections and then a general installation conveying water from the supply main and an installation conveying water from any other source of supply. So there mustn't be a connection between any downstream water to the upstream. There's got to be a physical break there. And then it carries on and it discusses even more areas where we've got to have a look at it. But then if we go down to 743, it says, again, adequate measures shall be taken to prevent back siphonage of water in the following. And then it says in part one, the design of terminal fittings installed is such that a hose or any other flexible pipe can be attached to the fitting. Now, most of our installations, we will have a garden tap. That is where you can connect a hose to it. A lot of your bath mixes these days, we've got a hand shower on there. That is a hose that is connected and it can suck back. Obviously, point two, where there are fire hose reels um, in the combined installation. So that is where you are supplying your fire mains and your normal installation all from one. It's not a split line. Or in point three, uh, underground irrigation system. 
So most people these days are not going for above ground irrigation. We want our gardens to look nice and we hired this irrigation system with pop-up systems or anything like that. So then definitely we must take prevention for backflow there. And then it says in point four, any other fitting that can provide contact between polluted water and water within the installation. And you'll see I've, at the bottom left-hand corner, I've put a little picture there of our combination water filler and overflow that most of us or a lot of installations these days have in the baths. Now, there again, you can suck water back. And in all these instances, we can see it says <clears throat> you shall take uh, prevention, adequate prevention to prevent back siphonage. So in terms of the national regulations there, the backflow preventers must be installed in any installation where there's a risk of contaminated water or harmful substances flowing back. And once again, it's not a, it'll be nice if you do it or something like that. It says, you shall. Now then it goes down and it gives us in table 12, the different types of backflow preventing measures that you can use. The first one is a reduced pressure zone backflow preventer. And then the application for that is where the possibility exists of contamination of the water supply by a substance that is hazardous to health. The other one that it mentions is a double check backflow preventer. And you'll see the picture on the screen there. Basically what it is, it's a unit and it's got two non-return valves in. Now, it's similar to the Irish, to be sure, to be sure, they wear belt and braces. So, yeah, you would have two non-return valves. If one fails, the second one will still stop it. But if we then go and have a look at what most of the municipal bylaws, and I've had a look at Joburg, the Free State, Cape Town, Durban, they all say the same type of thing. It says that your backflow preventer must have some sort of indication of when there is a backflow scenario taking place. Now, with a double check like that, you cannot see when it's failing because it's a sealed unit. There's no visible application for it. So it then takes us back to the reduced pressure zone backflow preventer. And I'll show you a little picture of that just now. Then a lot of your municipal bylaws also go a little bit further and it places the responsibility on the homeowner. It says that the homeowner is responsible for the installation of this. It's not the municipality that's going to supply it, but the homeowner has to do it. But it's also not just a fit and forget. All of them say that it's got to be serviced once a year. So I know in South Africa, nobody services, nobody maintains. Take for instance, geezers. Supposed to be serviced regularly. Nobody ever does that. But this is a chance where we can, when we install RPZ valves, put it on our database and make sure then we get back to the customer a year later and say to him, it has to be serviced again. Now it's time for it to happen. But then it goes even further. It says that every five years, it's got to be maintained or re, sort of overall. So you've got to change all your working components or replaced completely. So it's a little bit more complex than what we think. It's just, oh, you put a backflow preventer in and now you're done. There's an ongoing responsibility on the homeowner's side to do this. If we then have a look at your RPZ valve, there's a typical RPZ valve and you'll see at the bottom, there's a discharge port. And this particular one has got a little window on there so that you can physically see when any discharge takes place. But the outlet of the, this one, you can actually fit a 40 or 50 more PVC pipe to. But the law still says that it must discharge where it's visible. So it must draw attention to this. Now, what would happen here is if your municipal pressure fails, this port in the middle goes open vent, 
and any water in that section in the middle will discharge. After that, if the first or the second check valve on the downstream side leaks or doesn't seal properly, we'll get a continuous trickle at the bottom, which will then indicate that maintenance has to be done. It's got to be opened up, serviced, cleaned out. As you can see from the picture, it's not just also just the RPZ valve that gets installed. There's a strainer that needs to be fitted to it also to make sure that any dirt from the municipal side, bits of sand, grit or whatever due to maintenance from their side doesn't get into the RPZ valve. So it's like any check valve. If there's dirt sitting on the seat, it cannot shut off and it's going to leak. Then with that, there's got to be two isolating valves, one from the municipal side, one from the downstream side, so that you can shut it down on both sides. And then you can uh, remove the valve or open it up to work on it, etc. Then you lastly, your port there is where your discharge will take place. If there's any backflow happening, as I said, it will be visible. Now, a thing a lot of people are saying, but this is a big chunk of brass sitting above the ground and it's going to be stolen. Now, you can build a box or chamber around it to hide it, but then you will not see the discharge. So from the side of this chamber, you would then have to put a splay pipe coming out so that any water discharging into the bottom of this chamber will run out of there and it will again be visible. Be aware also that different areas of where you do your installations are subject to different legislation and registration and licensing of uh, any boreholes, grey water harvesting, rainwater harvesting and so forth. This is just a quick extract. I'm not going to go through it in detail. Uh, it will be available on the recording. So just be aware of it. Make sure of the area where you're working that you go and have a look and see where or what licensing or registration is applicable. Then also where there's alternative water sources. And according to uh, SANS 1186, this is a typical uh, sign that you have to put on telling people that it is non-drinking water. So this water should only be used for irrigation, anything like that, for maybe flushing a toilet, but it's not for normal human consumption. That is then the end of my section for backflow preventers and backflow and what SAN says about it.